before you in the name of your Son. And I know that you have set him on the throne. You have made him both Lord and Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, I know that you raise up men and you cast them down. You give life and you kill. And no one can deliver out of your hand. Father, I realize that if every army in the present, past, and future were to come together and fight against your Christ, it would be less than a mite beating its head against a world of granite. Father, I pray for godliness in this country. That the hearts of this people, whose foreheads are as hard as flint, would be turned back to you. That there would be a revival in this country. The Reformation. And that a godly government would be the reflection of a godly people. Father, our hearts are broken over Lord, when we think about the children Father, we pray for our children that they would be converted, that they would be strong, that you would protect them from evil and evil men, that you would continue to grant us freedom to teach them. Father, we pray for the countless millions of children, even this year, Lord, whose lives will be taken through abortion. Lord, a holocaust that no man can stop but you. Father, we pray, knowing that you get glory out of judgment, but in judgment remember mercy. What a great thing it would be, Father, to make this once again a righteous nation. Father, that the church of Jesus Christ might flourish here. Father, help us today with our study. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right, well, we're finally in chapter 3. And we're going to do some reading here. Uh, Starting at the beginning, I want to make comments on this introduction. We're going to talk about the Son of God in glory. Why is that? It is absolutely impossible to understand the cross apart from understanding the humiliation, the kinesis, the self-emptying of Christ. And it is impossible to understand the self-emptying apart from understanding His glory, His previous glory. You don't know how low He has come unless you know how high that He was. It's very important to understand this. If you'll notice that a lot of times in Scripture, in the things that we've been studying, that we must build a background before we can do glory. Before we can glory in who Christ is or God is, we must build a background to gain a perspective. We must have something like the photographer. He must have something with which to judge distance, and to get a proper perspective. In the same way, to understand the love of God in sending His Son, we have to put a background of the depravity of man. To understand the greatness of Christ's humiliation, we must understand something 
of His glory. So it's always doing your theology in the perspective of something. That gives it some reality. It allows you to compare and to see. And that's what we're going to be doing here. Now to say to understand the magnitude and majesty of the coming of the Son of God, we must first consider His divine nature and eternal glory. That this is not an angel, it's not a man, it's not a God, but the God of gods. In this chapter we will learn that the Son of God did not begin with the birth of Jesus. You'd be surprised how many children don't understand this. They've colored Joseph's coat in a coloring book in Sunday school so many times. They've heard all kinds of stories about the ark and everything, but they don't understand that Jesus did not begin at Christmas. But has existed throughout eternity, sharing equality with God the Father in both nature and glory. Just the word share, my young friend, any time we see Christ in a conjunctive relationship with God, it proves His deity. You see, the reason why the Jehovah Witnesses find so few proofs of deity in Scripture is they understand nothing of the glory of God. The uniqueness of God, the holiness of God, meaning that He's separate from everything. And that when something is put in a conjunctive relationship with Him, it is blasphemy. Unless that something is a person and that person is divine, equal with God. Because God shares His glory with no one. And he sets no one on the same level with himself. Now, it was not a mere man or even an archangel that was delivered up for our redemption. But it was the eternal Son of God, the Creator, Sustainer, and Sovereign Lord of all. Only to the degree that we have a proper view of the Son will we have a high view of the Gospel and a right appreciation of it. Now, sometimes men do heroic things. And we build monuments for them. And I'm not saying that's wrong. Man does a great thing, gives his life to save his entire platoon in war. I say that's a noble thing. That's a heroic deed. Men who have given themselves for the liberation of other men, for the prosperity of their own people, and we honor them. But to think that God becomes a man supersedes everything infinitely. There's an old Russian proverb, a Russian story actually, about a, a great Russian uh, prince and his servant. And they're in a sleigh. And they're being, they're being followed by wolves. Have you ever been to Russia? Those wolves are as big as bears. They're being followed by a pack of hungry wolves. They kept whipping the horses and whipping the horses, trying to go faster and faster and faster. And finally, when the servant understands that there's going to be no freedom and that they're going to be eaten, the servant leaps off the sled and throws himself into the pack of dogs that the prince would be saved. And everyone marvels and says, wow, what an illustration of Christ. No, if it had been a more accurate illustration of Christ, it would have been the prince who threw himself off the sleigh for the servant. And even that is a worthless illustration compared to what has been done. Now, little flock, if Christ has done this for you, will He not give you all things? If Christ has done this for you, will He not sustain you? Will He not be your helper? And will He let any evil touch you? No. You say, now hold on, Brother Paul. You sound like a, a charismatic preacher now. Christians suffer. Christians can even die. Christians can walk in poverty. Yeah, but see, you misunderstand something. I said He wouldn't let any evil touch you. I didn't say He wouldn't let any difficulty touch you. What's the difference? If He's ordained... This suffering, to conform you to the image of Christ, how dare you think it evil? He will let no evil touch you. And although your enemy, your dev the devil, may mean it for evil, God means it for your good. 
It's a win-win situation. Today and always, it's a win-win situation. Because no one's going to be anything and no one's doing nothing until God says. And if He says, it's all right. That's why sovereignty is very important, guys. Not just with regard to salvation. It's important with regard to everything. Now, let's read Charles Spurgeon, a young preacher who knew a little something about preaching. Before we can ever get a right idea of the love of Jesus, we must understand His previous glory in its height of majesty and His incarnation.